Welcome back to another episode of Scorpio Season. Um, I'm Lisa. I'm here today with my guest, Venkat. Hey, Lisa. And I'm here with my guest, Lisa. This is Venkat. Uh, Venkat, do you have a snack that you're eating today? Yes. So the letter F turned out to be really hard, but ended up uh, doing fingerling potatoes. So that's a fingerling potato with butter on it. You managed to find those at the grocery store. I'm impressed. We've had them for several weeks in the fridge. So this was kind of like one of our first shopping trips uh, before this thing hit. So we still had some left. But F is kind of an interesting word because you could just do F for food, but that seems like cheating somehow. Or F for like, you know, fried anything. But I decided I'm going to be as honest as I can. So the actual food name has to start with F, not the adjective. All right, so F for finger length. All right, so what topics do we have for the letter F? All right, for the letter F, we have, let's see, our list, we have feminism, fluency, food bank, fiction, the Fed, and faster than light communication, which is a little bit of a holdover from last episode. All right, so that's like five or six topics. So let's do you first on this two by two scheme we've made up. So uh, right. where would you rate yourself so should we on? Explain? Oh yeah, okay. So uh, we are doing this uh, two by two to rate ourselves on how much we know about the topics we are presuming to discuss, like from total bullshitting to like mm, one of us or both of us is an expert. So the x-axis is what Lisa knows. So if it's all the way to the left, it means Lisa is bullshitting. If it's all the way to the right, it means Lisa knows what she's talking about. Y-axis is me. If it's all the way at the bottom, it means I'm bullshitting. If it's all the way at the top, it means I know what I'm talking about. So this week's topics, where does your average lie, you think? Oh, so I have to do an average across all topics. That's okay. Yeah. Mm. Uh, I'm just going to go down the list because maybe, maybe we can like come up with an average score. All right. That's easy. Yeah, let's actually walk down the list and then you can, um, we can sort of uh, point move the around. position in each and um, move this around. Yeah, okay. Go. Okay, cool. So I would say I'm pretty expert at feminism. We can talk about that. All right. So that gets you. Where would you put yourself on feminism, then, Kat, so we can like do it? Uh, probably pretty low. Okay. So I would be here on feminism. Okay. Okay, cool. Um, the next one is fluency. I would actually put more. I would also, I would say I'm like fairly expert at the topics around fluency. Um, uh, I forgot. Why did we put that topic on the list? What I put it on the list because it's something I like talking about. <laughs> no, but in what sense do you mean fluency? Like language or some any kind of like activity? I think I mean it in like a. Di- so I think that mm, so we can talk about this, but I think I mean it both in like language and domains and, okay. and like the because ah, like being fluent in a language is a domain fluency. Yeah, and you could also talk about, for example, you are fluent in the language of Bitcoin programming. So that would be a different kind of fluency. A um, friend of mine uh, exactly. actually used the word infrastructure fluency, which I really like. Okay, so fluency, would you say you know a lot? So I think I know a lot about fluency, yeah. Uh, fluency, I think, okay. So I, we will leave you here at the extreme and I will be sli- I'll move myself slightly higher because I think I know something about fluency too. Cool. Okay, right. cool. Um, the next thing we have up is food banks. Um, I'm going to put myself uh, probably at like negative. So if this is like a unit. So if we're looking at like, if this is like a unit scale, so to speak, I put myself yeah. at like negative 0.5 on food banks. Okay, so we'll move you a little bit over here and I'll move myself down as well. So I'm kind of like and computing the average here. Okay, moving on. Oh, no, no, Van Kat, I'm on the, I'm on the negative side. I, I know, but it, you've, we've already done two topics, so it's dragged you a little bit to the left. Got it? Okay, gotcha. We're doing averages. Cool. Mm-hmm. Okay, yep, thank you. That's helpful. Um, okay, and then fiction. Um, I would say I know a decent amount about fiction. Yeah. Okay, so we leave you at, here for a decent amount. I think I know a little bit more about fiction than I do about food banks. I'm here. All right, next. Next is the Fed. Um, I think I know a decent amount about the Fed. Yeah, sort of. I think I know a decent amount about the Fed too. So I think uh, you're still a decent amount on the x-axis. So I'll move myself to maybe just about the line now. Okay. Great. Okay. And then the last one is faster than like communication. Um, I would put myself at like 
around a zero. Like I know some things, but there's definitely things I don't know. Okay, so you get dragged here and I also go down. So we are almost at the origin. <laughs> all right, so this is a, right. we are very neutral people on this. So, all right, let's things go for it. Right. Great, okay, so our first Stop like- sharing. Our first actual topic is, um, I think that's good. Okay. Um, so the first, first thing that we wanted to talk about is feminism. Um, I think you were the one who put this on the list. I added the, there's like a little emotion. All right. <laughs> All right. So let me mansplain feminism to you, a woman. <laughs> Please do. Yes. I, I, I love this conversation. Oh. One of my favorites. Sorry. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm kidding. I honestly don't know much about it. Like I vaguely, from sort of a reading perspective, I know there have been like four or five waves of it with different theories attached. And we are in what now, the fourth or fifth wave of feminism. So, and, and let's see, what are my credentials? Apart from being married and knowing a few women in my life, I would say I've read um, The Feminine Mystique by uh, Betty Friedan. And okay. I tried reading Simone de Beauvoir's uh, Second Sex, but uh, I didn't get very far. It was very dense existentialist philosophy kind of stuff. So, it's very, uh, I think it's in the tradition of critical theory, right? So it's mm-hmm. just like, yeah, yeah. Though she predated that by several decades, right? She would be, no, actually, I don't know the exact timing. Yeah, but I would, I would put the second sex into the like precursors of critical theory, if that makes sense. Like, okay, so I did my 30 second <laughs> take, you get three minutes or whatever. All right, so... What's your Wait, no, that feminism? Wasn't, that wasn't <laughs> Ben Cat, that was just a I feel like all you did is list your credentials. <laughs> is that like, uh, <laughs> I mean, I that's fine if we just want to go with credentialism, but I mean it, that's not quite credentials, but more like proof of good faith as in I've at least made a sincere attempt at some point in my life to get outside my own head and um, read about it. Uh, oh, I can add one more thing, I guess. Uh, at, at one point about seven, eight years ago, when I was, um, when my blog was still young and I was reading and writing a lot and I was reviewing books and something, uh, one of my longtime readers, he said, I should read more women writers. And that sort of comment kind of uh, stuck with me. And it took me a few years to actually find women writers I enjoyed reading, but once I did, it started getting more fun and easy. So one of them is our common shared um, favorite philosopher, Hannah Arendt. So we'll get to her in the letter H. And Ursula Ligon's um, science fiction novels are another in my top uh, few. Okay, so I've read some, I kind of know the basic skeleton history, but other than that, honestly, I find it hard to actually form any opinions or hold any actual views. I kind of just nod along when uh, women kind of um, say things. And when two women disagree about what feminism is in front of me, I back away about six feet and then let them continue. <laughs> I like that social distancing, like the six feet. So you just, just so you don't get infected. That's good. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, it's good to stay, you know, hygienic and un- uninfected. Um, the yeah so like i guess like around feminism it's there's one other thing that i think that it's always interesting to me from a perspective of talking to people about feminism and it's usually like okay how many women do you think you've worked with in your like professional context because i guess like i guess well i guess like in terms of like the feminism that i am the most interested in tends to be around workplace cultures um but that i think like a lot of that is like the shape of my experience, if that makes sense. Um, I think that's a very good lens, actually, because I didn't bring it up. But now that you mention it, that's been a big formative part for me. So when I started working at Xerox, mm-hmm. my first and only real job, uh, the manager I spent the most time with was a woman. And she was a major mentor for like, you know, learning management skills and stuff. So Diane, so if Diane is listening, hey, Diane. And at the time, um, my management chain all the way up was... Uh, dominantly women so my boss was a woman her boss was a man his boss was sophie vanderbrook who was then the cto then above that was ursula legan who went on to become ceo and then above that was um, Anne mulcahy so it was like a management stack of like five layers with only one guy in it so that's, that's pretty, uh, and that was very formative for me yeah i say that's pretty unusual um yeah because i feel like 
so this is like one thing about like, so I think my perspective on feminism is, I could talk about this for like a long time, um, but fairly complex. Um, but it's always interesting to like, I think one thing that tends to come up a lot when talking to men about feminism, again, in the workplace, because that tends to be the one I care about, um, is has to be like, okay, well, how many women have you actually worked with? And it's not like, I feel like, so I feel like like sometimes being a woman in the workplace, um, and maybe this isn't the direction we totally want to spend all our time on the feminism talk about, but it's always interesting to me to like have interactions with men and at some point just be like, okay, dude, like I have had this conversation in every job I've ever been in. Um, how many like, t- like, because I always work with men. I work in the tech field. Like I have never had a job where all the people that I work with are females, if that makes sense. Like it's never happened to me. I don't expect it to ever happen. Um, I have some friends on some teams that maybe have like 80% women and that's like cool and they love their jobs and they're very happy to be in those places because we all know how rare that is. But, um, what kind of places are those, uh- like marketing is one uh, I remember has a lot of women. Oh no, these are all tech people. Oh, I don't really know okay. people that work in other industries. <laughs> okay. I should, maybe I should. I don't know. But the ones I pay attention to are the ones in my industry because that's like, it's like mm-hmm. the good comparison. Um, yeah. Anyways, um, and we all kind of know where those places are, except sort of. I mean, I might be like sort of making this up. I haven't like checked in with my friends lately about how gender balance their orgs are but um yeah what was I saying oh so it's always interesting to me because like I feel like you kind of like you always run into like it's like sometimes I feel like it's deja vu because I end up having the same conversations or going through like the same steps of like conflict or just like self-expressionism like get learning how to communicate on the same page ism with people and at some point you just be like okay dude like I know that maybe this is the first time you're getting to work with a woman I understand how that's like a thing for you maybe probably but it's not my first time so like if we could like speed this up a little bit like that would be nice because I don't know um I don't know uh I will say that like there was that um hashtag you know, what is that uh, not all men and the response to that was yes all women that was, that was a pair of hashtags going around like a few years ago right, right? i don't remember Which, this uh, but i could believe it yeah yeah <laughs> um right so that's like i think that's definitely a thing and i think that like if more people would kind of keep that in mind so that would be kind of nice somehow is like maybe the reason this human as a woman is like exasperated with some of your shit is just like not you specifically but like the sum total of all the experiences has nothing to yeah. do with you personally but more like an aggregate and I think that I don't know I think that's I mean I think people are getting better about it but um I don't know I don't know um there's a definite learning curve uh, there like when i you know, look back at my own management experiences it's easy to relate to people who are in a supervisory position whether it's male or female because they have power over you it's kind of a simpler relationship if you're the subordinate and um, mm. when you're the manager or supervisor it gets harder so um, as a postdoc i think i supervised three undergrad um, women and I kind of got along pretty well with all of them and they all enjoyed their sort of uh, senior thesis project with me. But then when I started um, working at Xerox, I think uh, at the peak I had like 10, 12 people on my team Mm -hmm. and three were women. One really liked my management style and I think uh, it did her good to be on my team and she went on to manage her own teams and stuff. Uh, Two of them, I didn't, um, like not out of like malice or anything. I just didn't get it right. Like with all the guys, it was like uh, on a scale of one to 10, being a supervisor to a guy is like, for me, it would be like uh, with almost no effort, I can score an eight on 10. With women with high effort, I might score an average of five. So with some women, it'll be a three, with some with five, some a seven. So that's my exact distribution. Like uh, one woman, I guess, thought my style was a little too insensitive and mm. she wanted off the team as soon as I, as soon as she could. Another one, we had a little bit of a conflict and we resolved it. And the third one, like I said, kind of liked my management style, but that was a big learning experience for me because the individual nature of the relationships was uh, important. And I couldn't sort of come like, maybe if I had stayed on that path and 
learned a lot more. I might have come up with a general pattern of, all right, these are some broad differences in how you manage men and women. And if mm -hmm. I have these settings for men and these settings for women, it'll kind of work out. But I never got to that point. I went independent before that. So my current management skill level is I generically know how to manage men. And with women, I kind of have to do it on a case by case basis. Right. Yeah. And that totally, I think that kind of checks back with kind of that like thing that I asked earlier is like, okay, well, like how many, like, what's your like end of like experiences of working with women, right? Like just because of the nature of, I be, I'm guessing you were working in a fairly technical field, just by the like general population, like the total number of women that you get to like experiment on, so to speak, is like not that big to begin with. And then the poor women that everyone is having to experiment on, constantly and figure out their like style is they get a little bit like there's like a little bit of uh i don't know um i don't know how to explain like i guess you can kind of see though how that become become frustrating um to some extent and like yeah i don't know like i have a lot of thought i mean so like i think the thing that i would like I don't know how much time we want to spend on this topic. I think there's two points that I kind of want to bring up before we like move on to the next thing. But um, the first one is that I think that a lot of, a lot of like the problems that I see and maybe problems in the right word, but like sort of like um, suboptimal outcomes of being a woman working in a technical field that you tend to end up in. I think a lot of them, the um, kind of like, and the reasons for it are all different and it's not always something that you can overcome but the general like thread among all of them is like trust um intergender trust is just a really hard and fraught um yeah. thing to get i think that to some mm -hmm. level men tend to have like easier trust other men um and earning trust and getting yourself to a trusted position as a woman is a lot harder. Um, yeah. And that, and that, and like, and so you can see this in like women don't get paid as much, men get paid more. And it's like, there's some, I feel like there's like some of that has to do with a certain level or like, oh, you know, you work in an organization as a woman, but you don't get promoted. You don't get cool jobs. You don't get the trusted roles of leading the cool, interesting projects. Um, and yeah. like, I guess my like, and maybe this is a little bit of a um, sugar coating on some of that, but I do think that to a certain extent, it tends to be that you just don't end up in trusted, being a trusted member of the organization as much. Yeah. And there's a, there's a sort of asymmetry in the asymmetry slash moral hazard there, because uh, like um, clearly a lot of this is shaped by the fraught relationships are shaped by the you know, sexual harassment um, aspect of the things. And when that sort of thing enters a workplace, a typical reaction amongst um, the non-harasser guys is, I just don't want to like even be exposed to that risk. And they start pulling back and doing things like, all right, I will never be in a one-on-one -on -one meeting with a woman or that kind of thing. Like uh, Mike Pence is of course the model of that, um, of, uh, you know, uh, but then you, look at the second order effects of that and you realize that women are cut out of a lot of contexts where trust is built to begin with, right? So the cost of that risk mitigation strategy, again, is externalized onto women and the guys may be able to preserve their honor and sort of um, spotless reputation. But in the process of doing that, they kind of reinforce that, all right, the only trusted contexts are the all male ones. So yeah, I've, I don't have... Uh, sort of any clever ideas about what to do about that, but I've seen that all over the place. And uh, yeah. I see it in my consulting yeah. too. Like the couple of times women have approached me for consulting and coaching uh, support. This has always been sort of one of the top three or four issues that they wanted to like figure out how to work through. And honestly, that's an area where I don't have much consulting advice to offer. It's a fundamentally hard problem. Yeah. It's a hard problem. Yeah. So and what I was the to... second thing? You said you had two... Yeah. yeah. The second thing, right. Yeah. So trust is a hard problem. And I think that it's at the root of a lot of the problems that women face in the workplace. I get totally wrong. I know there's other things and there's probably more nuance to that. But if that was like the one thing that I would like want to talk about with that, that would be it. And then the other thing is that um, like you mentioned some writers that you've read that form like um, some basis of like feminist thought and like the critical tradition and like all that um i don't think i've actually read the second sex or the feminine mystique i think is the betty yep. freden freden one um 
I'm sure I've read excerpts from, I don't know, but I was going to say, I think the one that, I think the books, if, if, if people were like interested in reading a book on modern feminism, I think the book that I would recommend or that I read recently and really liked is, um, I think Sylvia Federici's The Housewife, Wages for Housework. Um, it's like, oh, okay. a, I believe it's like in the Marcus, Marxist tradition, but it applies kind of like Marxist labor theory um, precepts to women, like women in the household. And like, I, I mean, I, I really like things that have to do with economy and like where we, uh -huh. how we give money and what wages mean. Um, and I think that Federi Sylvia Federici's um, book does a really, is like a really interesting look at where money gets paid to and how valuation of labor is reflected in like wages and stuff and how we as a society so can Sylvia Federici wages of housework is that I the, think name of the book I think no. I don't we remember what the it book is. it's the wages for housework movement um oh, okay. oh so I have a question for you about that because one of the um I don't know, forks in the road of feminism that I've noticed coming up. So I don't know what wave we are on, probably the cusp of the fifth wave, but there seems to be a fork in the road between sort of a, I don't know, ironically trad feminism. So women like, uh, oh, our mutual friend, you probably know her too, Pamela Hobart. Uh, she writes a blog and has a coaching business, but people are sort of theorizing housewife 2.0. So they kind of want to, construct being a housewife and raising a family with kids and stuff like that in what you would, what would look like extremely traditional patterns, but in sort of a, I don't know, fifth wave feminist way. So there's like the unironic trads who kind of want to go back to 19th century ways of living and live the traditional household life. And then there's the ones yeah. who kind of look like that on the surface, but are not exactly doing that. So there's that. And then there's the people continuing the, uh, you know, uh, more, workplace oriented thing. So I guess that's the four. So equal pay, more power, more executive positions, more startups by women, all that stuff is mm -hmm. one bucket I see. Yes. The other bucket is, oh, let's actually go back and reinvent the home and domesticity and traditionalism in a new way. So uh, do you have thoughts and comments on that fork? Um, it's definitely a fork. I think that when I, I think I definitely, so I, it's interesting that you mentioned that because I definitely feel like I, earlier in our conversation, made a very succinct point that I was only going to be talking about the work bucket, right? Um, so like, right. So like, I definitely think it's, it's definitely something that I was like aware of and like pointed out earlier, but maybe not as clearly as you just have. Um, I think it's a fork. I think it's a good fork. I think that it, I think that, I think that it's a fork. I don't, well, hmm. I'm not sure if I'm answering your question here, but I think that the reasons that that fork exists make sense to me. Um, I think it's a valid fork to have. And I think that because they're, diff like, they're different domain spheres. Um, Got it. Like, it's a different, like, and, but I, I do think that they kind of, I think expectations in each have a tendency to bleed over into the workforce. So the the culture of the home I think has a tendency to bleed into your workforce like culture to an extent. Um, and that has to do with like, again, kind of like this trust thing and also like roles. People seem to have expectations, like an expectation grid set of how you apply those. Yeah. I, I, okay. If I understood what you're saying correctly, it's like expectations set on the domesticity fork kind of like leak over and contaminate sort of expectations and roles in the workplace fork, right? And even yes. though both might be sort of legitimate feminisms, so maybe we can call them 5.A and 5.B feminisms, they're both legitimate, but mm -hmm. the cross-contamination kind of like causes problems to be managed. And I guess the book you mentioned is one aspect going pointing one way, which is wages of housework or something. So sort of bring a workplace lens to the home. Uh, but if you go the exactly. other way, you end up with, um, you know, the... Uh, domestic lens on the workplace tends to lead to like really fraught 
ideas like, oh, women have a more empathetic style of management and that kind of like feminization of like corporate hierarchies. And by the way, a quick comment on that. That one I don't think is true. Like I, when I look upwards at the women who've managed me, there's only a distinction between effective versus ineffective management. I have never actually seen that distinction of like women have a more empathetic style and men have a more aggressive style. I've never actually seen that in my N equal to whatever experience. Like men and women are almost equally likely in my limited experience to be empathetic or aggressive style. Right. And both of those, but I think like those descriptors of like aggressive versus empathetic are like are cultural artifacts. And so like to an extent, I think that their application does like, I think there's things in like the broader culture of like the society that that workplace is operating in that can influence whether or not that's what you see and experience in the workplace because yeah. Like, I don't know. Um, yeah. Oh, I looked up the book, the book exactly that I'm thinking of and that I've read. I think Federici's written a couple, but Revolution at Point Zero, Housework, Reproduction, and Feminist Struggle is the one okay. that I've read. And it's like, it's like a collection of essays. It's pretty good. I enjoyed it. Um, oh, I have one closing yeah. thought on feminism before we move on. And I'm guessing you might have a closing thought or two as well. The My closing thought is, one is my, when I think about how my worldview has been influenced by women and women writers in particular, uh, even though I mentioned mm-hmm. like feminist writers writing about feminism type stuff, I would say the biggest influence has been just like women writing about stuff. Like uh, Agatha Christie it was uh, sort of one of my completest authors. Like I've read almost every mystery novel she's ever written. And she's not a modern feminist. She's very conservative or was, she's dead. Uh, and uh, that I think that sort of thing I think is important to index on like uh, which uh, how, how often have you looked at the world not just the condition of women but the world itself through the eyes of women and I think Agatha Christie should be called a huge feminist for being like you know widely read by both men and women another mm-hmm. one I grew up with which is not popular in America is uh, Enid Blyton she's a children's book author popular in the UK. So both were big writers for me growing up. Uh, The second comment I wanted to make was, there's a very Western sort of lens on feminism. And my one interesting lens on uh, feminism when it comes to Indian women is when India launched a Mars mission or sorry, moon mission or something. One of the recent Indian space program missions, there was a photograph that uh, went viral around the web of all the scientists in the control room who had worked on the mission. And dominantly it was all women and the interesting thing was they didn't look like you know western style dressed women who looked like they would be on the forefront of feminism they were like as the comment went they were like aunties and moms they were all in saris they were all older in their 50s or 60s all of them looked like my mom or aunt and it was like a real cognitive dissonance to say all right these are all actually astrophysicists or space scientists and they've actually designed a space mission and I think we need more such sort of uh, what the hell kind of moments where your stereotypical understandings of what feminism is kind of get shattered a little bit so we need more of that sort of thing anyway so your closing thoughts on feminism I don't don't know if I have any closing thoughts on (laughs) feminism I mean I feel like feminism is one of those topics that I never set out to be an expert in if that makes sense like it's one of those things that like I didn't really want to have to give a fuck about pardon my French like um it's not something I mean I like yeah I read like you know some stuff about women writers and stuff in college and like but I was a business major I wanted to like go out in an industry and like dominate and like run a business or whatever um but it's just like the way like that's not there's like there's no way through the business world without becoming an expert in feminism is what I've did like come to this conclusion if that makes sense um which I think is just an interesting thing to consider when you like people like well how did you get radicalized and it's like I lived my life (laughs) um not that anyone's ever asked me that I don't think I've ever been accused of being radical anything is that true? I think I've been accused of being a radical. You don't strike me as radical um, yeah. at all. I mean, you're, you have very decided opinions on this stuff, but you don't strike me as radical. 
Uh, but it totally makes sense what you say, okay. because even though women are 50% or more of the population, more like 51, 52, effectively, they are like in a minority situation in many workplaces and stuff. So to some extent, um, the experience of being a woman in tech and like, you know, maybe 5% of the workforce in a company or whatever it is, would be like being an immigrant in a new country. So uh, I, that aspect I can resonate with. It's like, all right. I never set out to be a spokesperson for all things Indian, but sometimes I'm put in the spot of, all right, you're the Indian in the scene, explain something about India to us. So, and I'm sure it happens all over the world. Like when you go to Brazil, you would be the American having to explain America to Brazilians, right? So you're kind of like- Right, and at some point you just decide that, or at some point you just decide they're just going to think every American eats like chips and salsa for is like their favorite thing. Cause that's just, you know, yeah. At some point, I, I did a kind of like for the for the Indian thing I'm talking about. I kind of just did a shrug, read me as you like, and draw whatever inferences you want to about India. I'm not representative, but it's not my business to educate you on how I'm not representative or whatever. So I kind of like just gave up that job. But then it was kind of a relatively low cost option for me because Indians in the U.S. are not a particularly oppressed minority or anything. We are in mm-hmm. like high earning, typically well-positioned minority, which you can't support a lot of people. All right. What do we have next to talk about? Uh, Next in our list is uh, fluency. Hmm. All right. How do you define fluency? Yeah. So, uh, so I think like the aspect around fluency that I find, I find fluency fascinating um, because it's definitely something like, I just find, I guess it's like one of those things that I really, didn't realize I was becoming it's one of those like again like speaking of fields I never expected to become an expert in fluency is not something I set out to become an expert in but like just through the nature of pursuing the things that I was interested in like have become I believe like a very good expert at what it means to be fluent in a thing um and we were talking a little bit earlier before we started our show today about it um we mentioned like so you were like oh is you mean fluent in like a language or in like a problem space and I went yeah like I think I think that's I think it's interesting that you can be I think like so fluency in a language is the one that most people are like used to hearing fluency in right like when you talk about fluency fluency in a foreign language is probably the most common uh what do you call it like um thing people are familiar with um but prototype yeah yeah yeah, like the prototype or context in which the word fluency is like exactly understood um but i but like learning software development um is also like the thing with software development is there's like a lot of different domains that you can become fluent in um they're all like, there's like a jillion of them. Um, every new language that you learn is a new like programming language. There's like a level of fluency in that language that you develop at the time of using it. Um, I don't know, which I just think is like it's just fascinating, and it's definitely one of those things that like I almost like I feel like I've done it enough times. I've like learned enough domains enough times that I can like chart my emotional progress through the fluency uh-huh. like on ramp, if that makes sense. Um, and I always get frustrated at the same point in it. And like, I get all the same emotions. I want to quit. I want to like, I just get like super upset at myself and <laughs> super frustrated because like, I can't express the thing I want to express. Um, I guess it's like, that's like part of it, right? Is there's always this point in fluency where you're not as fluent as you want to be yet. Um, I feel like you're people like, I think in general, like if we go back to like foreign languages, um, your reading comprehension always runs ahead of your writing skills or like your expression. Yep. So like, or like listening runs ahead of speaking. Um, so every time you're learning a new problem domain and like even singing, like I definitely mm-hmm. went through this with like learning how to sing um, where like you're, you can, you can understand what the other person is saying in a language context, but you can't express what you want to yet. Like you Uh don't have the fluency to be able to do that. And that's just like a really frustrating spot to end up in. Um, And it's consistent. So just listening to you right now, I've recalibrated 
my own sort of position on the fluency acts or when we were you know plotting on how much we knew so i would now put myself very low on that because honestly uh, i think i suck at this like uh, to take programming which is something both of us have some familiarity with you seem really good at like um, mastering all the different pieces that go into kind of like a production tech environment like something like the bitcoin environment is like i'm sure Ten different moving pieces that you have to like assemble together to get anything done. You're an Android developer, which is another kind of like messy stack like that. The only sort of computing yeah, sort of so thing I've ever mastered to any degree is MATLAB, and MATLAB is this very sandbox kind of like uh, programming environment where you can go very deep. You don't have once you learn the basic paradigm, you can go deep, and it's a sort of a fluency. It's a very easy fluency domain. but each time i tried learning any other sort of more production uh, programming kind of technology stack i got to as far as like the hello world tutorial in like six seven different languages but never beyond so what you're describing as the frustration point is my quit point so even though like i learned basic in high school i learned a little bit of c and a little bit of fortran as my cs 101 all mm-hmm. of them not very far at all but i would basically say i suck at fluency which is uh, which is another way of saying i'm a quitter I quit when things get <laughs> a little frustrating and annoying, and I like things to very quickly get into a fluid sort of flow state. I can't handle the roughness for too long. Yeah, I think I'm a little bit of a masochist when it comes to learning, which has been very helpful <laughs> in my career. I'm just gonna say that, but yeah, because um, even like I have a tendency to pursue things I'm not good at, <laughs> which is. sort of hilarious. I don't know why it's hilarious. So like I feel like the best example of this is like in high school I took tons of classes. I was like such a overachiever in high school. Um the only classes <laughs> I ever got a B in in high school were the Spanish classes. Like mm-hmm. I don't know. It just something about learning Spanish just like did not get with my brain. What did I end up ma- I mean I majored a lot in a lot of things in university, but one of the things I ended up majoring in was Spanish and Portuguese. <laughs> um just because like are you fluent just, in both now you said you're fluent in portuguese right are you fluent in spanish as well more or less oh, yeah wow. okay that was actually really fun figuring out how to be fluent in both is actually like honestly another really fun challenge because of how similar they are um so there's a point there uh, i want to point out for people who are not multilingual like we both are there's actually two kinds of multilingualism You are a native speaker of English, but you learned Spanish and um, Portuguese kind of like in school and as an adult, right? So you've you have acquired yeah. adult fluency in Spanish and Portuguese. Like in my twenties, yeah. Yeah, uh, whereas I speak uh, three languages fluently, but I acquired all of them as a kid, like before five. And um, this is common in like countries like India. So for me, that's English, Hindi, and Kannada. And uh, other people are even weirder, like my niece. she grew up uh, almost fluent in like five languages because she spoke uh, kannada like me at home hindi on the streets english in like kindergarten or whatever she was learning mm-hmm. her child care provider was a bengali woman so she learned some bengali as well so mm-hmm. there's one other mm-hmm. language i forget but she's forgotten a couple of them so now she's uh, she lives in america now so she just knows the one uh, one and a half languages i would say but the thing is when you learn things as a child the child brain does not actually like make neurological boundaries between languages you're picking up so you don't actually realize you're learning three languages so this actually has mm-hmm. been shown in neural studies or whatever like adult language acquisition develops new parts of the brain whereas child language acquisition even if you learn two or three languages it'll only sort of develop one part of the brain so for a long time i had the sort of mistaken sense of my own sort of fluency capacity it's like hey i must be good at fluency because i speak three languages fluently no it's not true <laughs> so that was just like the bonus of being right. a kid in a multilingual country interesting as uh, that was really interesting so now i'm kind of yeah i do think that like learning a second language was the hardest thing i first hard thing i ever did mm-hmm. i think i think that's fair to say um and it was like but i like learning your first language your first second language is the hardest language you'll ever learn because half of learning it is learning how to learn a new language like the meta game yeah. of learning a new language is like the hard part and once you figure out how to learn a new language like i'm i can like kind of get french 
I like started studying Mandarin for a while. Like, <laughs> wow. But like you figure out kind of like the meta game that is the language learning. I don't really know Mandarin, but like if I spent time on it. So, so, so let me ask you about that. So you've got language competency as an adult and you've got a lot of programming stack competency. Are the meta games similar? Is the meta game of learning human languages kind of similar to the meta game of programming? Yeah, so what's the sort of broad patterns there? Yeah, right. And I was, I mean, even like learning how to sing as an adult, I didn't start singing till I was like 25, 26, which is pretty late. Wow, okay. Um, ah, but like, okay, but this is like, so I think like you almost start, so this is like, this is where it gets like really interesting is it starts to almost become this like learning a new problem domain is the meta game, right? It's like, how do you learn a new subject? Like, how do you approach a new field? And I think like, mm -hmm. this is what's made me, I, I got into Bitcoin only a year and a half ago. Um, and like some of my coworkers are like, yeah, you just like pick stuff up really quickly. And it's because I think I've been <laughs> through this game of how do you get into the new thing so many times now. Um, Ah, oh, man. I think that well, like... Let's talk about one a new thing because seeing it behind you kind of reminded me. So F for Faraday cage. That should be on our list, but it's not. Is that your Faraday cage? Yeah. Is that a new thing you're learning how to build? Yes. All right. So uh, walk us through the learning curve of Faraday cages here. I'm still... Okay. So I feel like I haven't done as much research as I should. Um, I've done some research. I did like... Okay. So... So do you want me to just like talk about the, the project? Yeah. Little? Yeah. Let's uh, hear about the Faraday cage project. Um, okay. So it's kind of, it's sort of a joke. So it's, it's, I'm kind of like, I'm going to put it into the category of art pieces. It's an art piece that I'm working on. Mm -hmm. Um, and the reason I put it there is because I don't have a lot of confidence that it's going to actually achieve the like engineering goals that I have <laughs> of it. And the reason that I'm not convinced that it's going to achieve the engineering goals is that I'm haven't, well, I, I spent a little bit of time looking for it because you need measurement tools. If that makes sense to like, oh, uh, uh, but before we get too far along this, uh, uh, explain what a Faraday cage is for those who don't know and why you okay, want a Faraday to cage. Right. <laughs> so a Faraday cage is a, um, it's a, oh God, my understanding of it is that it is a barrier, a, an electric, electromagnetic pulse barrier. So it stops electromagnetic waves. I believe that's the term. EMP pulses um, and anything. So like a category of like, oh, it's an AMP pulse, whatever. Any electronic that off gives like a Wi-Fi signal is emitting electromagnetic pulses. So the way that like Wi-Fi and cell towers work is through EMP like communication, basically. Mm -hmm. um, and yep. those are like, it's by, I think, I think, I think this is correct. If we were like back on that two by two, I would kind of put myself more on the not as expert side on this. <laughs> um, but my understanding is that it's like basically it's emitting like an electrical or like a energy pulse through the air, right? Like it's in the same, um, it's on the same spectrum as light, right? There's like the visible yeah. electric magnetic pulse um, spectrum and that is everything light that you can see. And then you get into like the microwave and like, I can't remember. So there's two way, two ends off. Like one way you go towards infrared and the other, I feel like you go towards ultraviolet light, depending on which yeah. direction off the like visual light spectrum you go. And I don't remember which direction um, cell signals live, but it's one of them. It, anyway, so that's like it, kind of below. Like, it would be below, right? It's infrared. All radio is infrared. Ultraviolet is things like x-rays okay. and stuff. Right. Anyways, but it's basically, okay. So that's like the, that's like the genre mm -hmm. of signal that you're dealing with. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so Faraday cage is, Faraday cages are basically, my understanding is contiguous um, planes of conductive material. So like metal, so like aluminum sheeting mm -hmm. um, that these electromagnetic waves cannot penetrate due to the interaction of the pulse, like the energy in the pulse and the, um, that the planarness of the, um, conductivity of the material that inter interacts with yep. is the general understanding. So I wanted to, as like kind of a, I don't know if it's funny. I think it's funny art piece, build a cage to sleep in. So it's like my bed, um, that in theory would block 5g because that's been in the news lately. <laughs> um, so five F five G, um, Faraday cage. Yeah. But like the things about, five, so there's a couple of things about 5G. Um, one is that like, so 
typically there's like spectrum bands that um, you can go and like Wi-Fi works in a specific spectrum band, right? And that has to do with the, I believe, mm -hmm. amount of energy and well, frequency of the wave, which is like a function of how much yep. energy goes into the wave form. But um, mm -hmm. uh, the, the Faraday cage, like, so I'm putting together a Faraday cage, but I want to be able to sleep in it. So there's like kind of some design requirements around what kind of material I can use to construct my, um, the conductive barrier out of. So mm -hmm. I'm not 100% sure. There's two things I'm not sure about, and this is why I'm like being like art piece because it might not actually stop 5G. <laughs> um, two things that there are one, um, 5G isn't a specific range. There are a couple of different ranges that different cell phone companies have decided that they will okay. call their 5G range. Um, I think one of them is all the way up in like 32 megahertz, which is pretty high up the range. And then the other was like kind of in the lower, like lower one or 200, or maybe it's gigahertz. Maybe it's like 32 gigahertz. And then like there's lower, like in the lower. Th Anyways, so it kind of depends on what spectrum yeah. band they were able to get or something. So, um, so if I understand the theory correctly, if I remember vaguely, the size of the holes in the cage yeah. have to be in some proportion to the wavelength that you're trying to block, right? So right. Uh, how big can the mesh, how, how, what's the mesh size? for a 5G blocking. Exactly, I tried to do some like, right, but so the problem with not having a specific, like a certain and exact like uh -huh. number is that you can't get like a exact like thing because it's so wide, if that makes sense. Ah, like, got it. 5G isn't like specified exactly, so you can't exactly whatever. Anyways, and then it also goes back to like, I think like, so if you're able to construct like a, um, like if you had like pure aluminum, that would be fine. And that should block, like, it doesn't matter the range, mm -hmm. but, like catch everything. Um, so like, so like, I kind of like, I got some materials. What I ended up using for my project is, um, I bought aluminum, like screening for windows, just so aluminum window screening. And it has mm -hmm. like the, the gap is like one millimeter. So it's like okay. pretty small. Um, I tried wrapping it my phone with it just to see how effective <laughs> it was on like my phone. Um, it cut the signal down a lot, but it didn't block it when I wrapped it in. So then I took the, I took the screen and wrapped it in aluminum foil and that totally worked that like cut off calls and stuff. But, um, <laughs> I can't wrap my bed in aluminum foil because I would get very hot. You know what this reminds me of this uh, sort of, um, meta pattern of learning how to build Faraday cages. The meta pattern oh. is the same as build, um, making masks for a coronavirus. Yes. Like people are talking about droplet sizes, getting through masks and stuff. So you're trying to build like <laughs> a, a digital mask for uh, blocking out. All right, so uh, on the yeah. scale of like all the things you've tried to learn, uh, how hard is the meta pattern of trying to learn about Faraday cage construction compared to say language acquisition? So I guess this is hardware, uh, electromagnetic, Hardware construction is the domain compared to software languages or human languages. Is it hard, harder, easier? What is it? I think the difference is that I don't have to like express myself through like the mechanics of like electric magnetic pulses, if that makes sense. No. Like I'm not, I don't have to like take a new, I don't have to take like the, um, I feel like what I've done is construct like a worldview and I'm like, so I've like constructed like a pattern or I've constructed like an understanding of how the parts like relate to each other. And so there's like a system of relations that I can like relate to you. And so in order to like understand and build like a Faraday cage and have like a decent understanding of what it's capable of, like required me building a model of the relations of these like different parts, like mm -hmm. size in the screen and exactly like what the interaction is between the, um, rays of whatever um so that was like definitely i think that's definitely like a model building but i don't think that's the same as the need to like express a thought in uh, th that's interesting because you described this earlier as an art project but it actually gives you less room as an yeah. artistic medium for expression than say software or language or music because it's like right. pure commodity physics you have to get the yes. physics right and it's done it's performance art. It's like, a, it's a performance, right? It's like, a, it's like I'm, I'm composing the pieces and I'm putting on like the play and the play that I'm composing is pretending to shield myself from 5G. <laughs> um, but you know, you gotta like set the, like you have to like set the stage and construct the scene and like have like all the parts together. So I think it's a lot more like playwriting 
than it is like piece like music composition, for example. So, <clears throat> sorry, this is basically your really large bed sized tin foil hat, right? Yes. Yes. <laughs> That's the performance art piece of it. Uh-huh. Yes. And like, yeah, no, I was joking with my friend, like I, I'm going to, so the title of the art piece is debunked. <laughs> okay. That's funny. <laughs> Anyways, it's like kind of a joke. Um, but then it's like, I guess I feel like more like, I feel like the thing is an art piece is more of the play and the fluency and what it means to be art. Like I would see that that is almost mm-hmm. like a fluency, right? Because it, it's like a playing yeah. with this concept of art. Um, Whereas the actual construction and like production piece is not as much of a, I mean, I guess it's like demonstrating some amount of fluency and understanding. Yeah. yeah, So you're you're doing like, there's actually fluency in two things going on here. There's fluency in constructing electromagnetic hardware contraptions. And then there's fluency in the aesthetic grammar of this kind of performance piece. Right. So, yeah. So you're trying to learn two things at once here. Nice. I guess. All right. Yeah. Uh, how much uh, I think, time do we have left for more topics? I think I think we're getting kind of close to. I don't know. We've got let's, say, let's, let's pick topics. one more. How's let's let's pick sound? one more. Yeah, go ahead. One more. Let's. Do you want to um, talk about something? Are you want to talk about food banks? Okay, so let's do food banks. A quick comment I had. That's why I put that on there. So we've been hearing a lot about all the supply chain uh, disruptions of various sorts, but the food bank one was an interesting one. Apparently now the lines at food banks are longer than ever, but food banks are having trouble sourcing uh, groceries and food and other essentials to hand out because grocery stores don't have like uh, surpluses they have to get rid of because people are stockpiling. So basically people buying lots of like groceries much more than usual leaves much less like, you know, Um, almost due to expired produce or whatever it is that food bank goes to food banks. So they are having a shortfall. So it's like there's a extreme demand spike and a supply crunch at the same time affecting food bank supplies. So I I thought that was kind of like, uh, I don't know, something that stuck in my head as like a weird second order effect of uh, the pandemic. Yeah, because it really like highlights the whole. I feel like I feel like there's a couple domains. I feel like there's a couple instances that still point back to like the same kind of domain problem, and that um, the food and like a lot of goods production, like production and supply chains, are split between like almost I would say like consumer and like business. Mm-hmm. Um, and all of a sudden, we've like dumped a lot of like food demand onto the retail. This is actually a third thing, though, because you've got the uh, business and consumer supply chains. This is the nonprofit supply chain. Like there's an entire third supply chain that goes to like um, charitable and safety net uh, stuff. So, yeah, I think there's so that that was actually the now that I think of it, that was the reason I put this on the list, because it struck me as not fitting the consumer versus business narrative. There's a third supply chain we've not talked about. So there's actually, I think four supply chains total. There's the financial supply chain of like distributing money. We talked about the Cantillon effect uh, when we were talking about C. So there's the financial crisis is due to the money supply chain. Then you've got the business supply chain. It's shut down and having a glut. And you've got the consumer supply chain that's having weird stockouts and seeing a surge in demand. And Mm -hmm. now this is the new one that I just noticed. The nonprofit supply chain, which a lot of like the most unfortunate people depend on. Right, but if the food for the food banks is coming from grocery stores, you can send their stocks and they are downstream of the retail or like. Yeah, okay, yeah, exactly. So yeah, they also get squeezed because it's like almost a chain of who gets what first in what order. Um, right. Though there's actually, they're at greater risk because in many cases, the business and consumer supply chains are less interchangeable than they think like toilet paper. That's been sort of the running joke of this thing. But I just learned in an article I read that one part of the toilet paper crisis is actually real because consumers tend to buy a different grade of toilet paper than businesses and commercial establishments. Whereas something like wheat or rice, it's more like just lot sizing. So we, you and I would buy maybe two or five pound bags of wheat or rice. Restaurants would buy 50 pound bags, right? So that's a lot sizing issue. There's a grading issue as well. And um, the nonprofit stuff, I think there's a mix of both. Like, 
I don't know what kinds of items get marked eligible for food stamps, for example, and what kinds right. of stuff goes to food banks. Uh, so there, there's probably a lot of this stuff going on. Anyway, yeah, so that was yeah. my sort of short segment on food banks. Do we have time for one more or? Yeah, let's do it. Um, you pick the last one. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, I don't know, Venkat. Um, let's see, we'll, we have fiction, the Fed, and faster than light communication. Um, I don't know if I want to talk about fiction. I could talk about the Fed. So that seems like a longer conversation. Yeah. So it looks like, oddly enough, faster than light is the one we can sort of, it's conceptually the hardest, but uh, it's the one we can sort of quickly wrap yeah. up in two minutes, right? Because the Fed. Is yeah, let's wrap like, it up in two minutes. Faster <laughs> than light communication. Ready, set. Yeah, I mean, well, physics wise, it's impossible. So I think we can reduce it. Actually, we can bring in fiction to here. Because since it's anyway, okay, so yeah. we can just ask about what's your favorite faster than light um, communication model. So I will, so let's each share one. So mine is um, one I really liked was in Hyperion. So Hyperion, the science fiction novel, uh, I forget who wrote it, but it has a technology called Farcasters. And Farcaster, as the name implies, is some sort of hyperspace technology, which, you know, portals different parts of the universe together. But the interesting part of that is I see it, there's a bit of design fiction there that I've never seen in any other science fiction novel, which is uh, multi-world houses. So you've got these really rich people in this uh, fictional universe who build houses based on forecaster technology, where each wing or room of the house is actually on a different planet. So doorways between rooms are portals that are like hyperspace portals. So that's an interesting FTL scheme. So now I'm sort of- That um, reminds me of- yeah. I was going to say that kind of reminds me of, I'm going to get her name wrong, Shinoe Hart's presentation at Refactor Camp last year about like houses on wheels that would reconfigure. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, this is kind of a shout out, but yeah, okay. That is a really good talk. Yeah, good connection there. I now want to go back and rewatch that. She had some really interesting slides on how the evolution of corridors and things happened. So I now yeah. want to go back and look at that. Oh, the reason I'm thinking about right. you know, multi-world houses is I've been sort of um, and I'm having some fun with the idea of like eventually owning a mansion, which will never happen. And since it's never going to happen, I might as well make it as fictional as possible. So my new art project, which I probably will sort of quit, unlike you with your Faraday cage, is to build a virtual reality multi-world mansion. So that's my project. Mm. I want a five room mansion with each room in a different part of the galaxy. It's going to be in VR. I'm going to wander around in it. And then I have a Twitter account called Basic Mansion, which is my alt, which is that fictional mansion is starting life by tweeting about its life. It's also a smart mansion. It can talk. So that's my FTL project. <laughs> That's really adorable. Um, sorry, maybe adorable isn't the like word you were going for, but um, oh. I love that you're like, I'm basic mansion of five rooms is incredible to me <laughs> living in Texas as I definitely, my small town. Right now I'm in a six barefoot <laughs> apartment where I don't even have enough room to run my VR rig properly. So the Oculus Quest I just bought a few weeks ago, it's minimum play area requirement is six feet by 6.5 mm -hmm. feet. And my living room carpet area is less than that. So I keep running into the boundary of that. So talk about cages. There's like a Faraday cage, like virtual thing I keep running into. Mm. So I'm trying to squeeze a space mansion into a less than normal sized VR play area. <laughs> Oh, uh, you've got some. I love that you have like space constraints even in VR, like even in the virtual world. The like you've got like yeah. constraints you're building with. Okay, cool. I'm gonna go find. Wait, what was the Twitter for this again? Like Basic Mansion. Uh, basic Mansion. Yeah, I've been tweeting okay. on that for a while. Great, cool. Uh, okay, maybe we should update our right. ads. You today. have an FTL idea you like? A what? Oh, do you have a faster than light favorite trope or science fiction idea you like? I feel okay. So there's, I think I have two comments on this. One is, I feel like the only faster than light, I feel like I've read a few things that have faster light communication. The only one I really remember is like Arts and Scott Cards Ansibles. Oh, yeah. Which were interesting because of the like, it was interesting because like information could travel faster, like instantaneously, but the people in the books couldn't. So it kind of mm -hmm. like, I think there's like a decent amount of play in. I saw the like Ender's, it was like the Ender's series, right? There's like four series, four books about Ender's game. Yeah, the Ender's game had a bit of that. 
Um, and the Ansible idea, he borrowed that from Ursula Ligon's um, dispossessed uh, universe, right. right? I forget what that universe is called. Yeah. 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 But that's, yeah, I didn't learn that till later. I read Scott's stuff way before Ursula. Um, yeah. Which, like, was interesting. And the other, I don't know. I think the other thing is that I, as we kind of touched on last time, and I don't think I did a great job of explaining it in the last podcast, but um, I think that you, I think that ansibles are possible. I'm not okay. sure the fidelity of the communication, like the bandwidth, so to speak, is mm -hmm. big enough to make it practical in terms of like what types of messages you would want to communicate. Um, and that the setup cost, it might be kind of similar. Are you, are you familiar in like, so in cryptography, there's this concept of perfect secrecy or like perfect, um, yeah, I think it's- Yeah, yeah, we, we talked about that last time, yeah. So, right, so there's a concept in perfect secrecy that involves a key, like a blinding key. Uh, it involves a, the perfect secrecy is almost impossible. Um, and the reason it's almost impossible is that the communication channel requires, makes it such that it's basically impossible. Well, so the way I, I understood it, it for that. cryptographic or quantum cryptography is that it's not that it's perfect security is possible, but that it's impossible to hide the fact that you've um, stolen a message. So if you try to steal a cryptographically okay. or quantum cryptography message, by the fact of trying to eavesdrop on it with, say, a man in the middle attack or something like that, you will sort of uh, disturb it. And so the two parties will know that the message has been tampered with or uh, right. uh, leaked out. So that's, I think, the right. key. But uh, that still doesn't get us FTL. And I think last time when we were talking about sending a signal from Beetlejuice and so forth, we didn't land on a consensus, but I think, um, yeah, we still haven't done our research, so we're both bullshitting. Yeah. No, I haven't done my research. No, but what you're talking about is slightly different than what I was talking about. I was talking about Claude Shannon's oh, okay. theory of it's perfect funny. secrecy, and what you're talking about is the quantum cryptography, which I believe... Oh, okay, yeah, so... We're, yeah. I believe there's actually, like, a good... I think that... I think... I might be wrong about this, but I think David Deutsch's The Fabric of Reality has, like, a small section at the end. No, maybe it's a different book. There's like a small section on quantum cryptography. Maybe is it, is it, or maybe it's like, what's that code book by that guy? Oh, it's got like a gold <laughs> cover. I don't know. It's really good though. It's about, no, I think, it, I think it's that, man, am I going to look it up? Uh, oh, what's that code book? The code, is it like code breakers or the code something? God, is it about it. the Enigma okay. people? It's, it's, the World it's, War II Enigma stuff? No, there's like a book on like codes that goes through like a basic understanding of like cryptography and the like problem domain that is cryptography. Maybe it's called like the code book. Um, I think there was one book by Simon Singh. Yes, that's it. That's the one. Yeah, I think it's the Simon, Simon Singh. Singh. Book. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think he talked about, yeah, the code book. It is called the code book. Um, by Simon okay. Singh. And it's a great, it's a, yeah. And it's got, it has the intro to, um, it has the introduction to quantum cryptography where it talks okay. about this interruption problem that you're discussing. Um, yeah. And you have yeah. a basic so um, Shannon point that there's no such thing as perfect uh, secrecy because entropy leaks out kind of uh, at a thermodynamic level secrecy. No, right? no, no, no. That's not the problem at all. So the problem, okay. the problem with, so the, <laughs> The problem with perfect secrecy is that the key that you're using, like the, so the general idea in cryptography is you have a message you want to send mm -hmm. and you have another set of information which hides the message. And yep. so it's like a, a screen that you pull across it and then you send the screened information over the yep. wire and then the person on the other end has the thing to reveal the screen and read the message, yep. like the general idea. Yeah. Um, and the general problem in cryptography is that how much data it takes to communicate the nature of the screen that you're sending. Um, ah, okay. In perfect secrecy, the screen is as long as the message, which is to say that every, every like piece of information that you want to send has a unique and uncorrelated to any other part in that screen bit or like information that screen. Ah, got it, got it. Okay. So in order to send a perfectly secret message, you would also need to communicate this perfect and screen of the exact same length as the message because each of those pieces is independent. 
But oh, if you have a channel it. of in communication in which you can transmit a message as long as your message, and it needs to be secret, right? Like if you figure out- Oh, okay, there's a paradox it, there, exactly, yeah. Yes, so if you have a channel of communication in which you can communicate a screen that's as long as the message you wish to send, then why don't you just send your message over it? Exactly, so I think um, uh, my understanding is sort of um, complementary to that. That's actually a restatement of the second law of uh, thermodynamics applied to information entropy, uh, which is that um, any practical system to be usable at all, the screen piece has to be shorter than the message you want to send. But then that creates a trade-off of right. to the extent it's shorter, it's going to be less secure. And so in that sense, it sort of leaks it out. So it's a lossy uh, thing. So there's, a, there's an entropy angle here, the entropy of the message versus uh, whatever. So again, I'm, I don't want to bullshit too far right. out, out of my expertise uh, here. Okay. Right. Well, and the reason that it's shorter is that you require then in order to expand it, so, because you have to like expand the screen, right, to mm -hmm. cover the message. And it's in the process of expansion that you create patterns and those patterns become um, exploitable in terms of trying to determine what the screen, because as soon as you can guess what the pattern of the screen was, then you can unscreen it. Yep. Anyways. All right. Uh, so I think that's all the time we have uh, this week. Cool. All right. So. Great. Thank you. All right. Well, uh, it's always a pleasure to talk to you, Venkat. Um. Yes. All right. See you guys next week. All right. See you next week. Bye. Bye. Scorpio Season is proud to be sponsored by uh, Smoke and Screws, the premium filter for your glass pipes, water pipes, and one hitters. Check out their next generation screen technology at smokeandscrews.com. Uh, we're also proud to be sponsored by Art of the Gig a subscriber-only newsletter for freelancers and independent consultants. Learn more about how to take your consulting practice to the next level at artofgig.com. Uh, great. Um, and if you liked our show, don't forget to like and subscribe.